Good evening. How is everyone tonight? A little warm, I imagine. Just think, if you were in New York City this evening at Trinity Church, where my last college met, it'd be 15 degrees warmer and the humidity would be that much higher. Give thanks for the West Coast and dry weather. It's not that bad. I'm not sweating yet. I've been charged to give a charge to all of you, a charge to the students. But when I thought of my charge this evening, I thought that the better charge to give is a charge to all of us, a charge to every student here. We have first-year students in the first three rows making their first way through Providence Christian. We have students, people who know what they're doing, so to speak, in the rows behind them, cheering them on. We have faculty and staff behind me who can barely hear me, but who are in likewise in need of a charge on this warm night. So these words are not simply meant for all of you in the first three rows who are new to this college. They're meant for everyone here. They're meant for me. They're meant for everyone trying to get through this great year and to do the best that we can do. My charge boils down to 10 words, 10 words that I want us to remember tonight and throughout this year. Be joyful. Be grateful. Be resolute. Be better. Be good. Why joyful? Because this year, like every year, is a wonderful opportunity for you to explore God's creation with curiosity and wonder. Curiosity and wonder. He made the world and gave you a mind that you might delight in his artistry. Why grateful? Because many others have made sacrifices for you to be here. Many others have made sacrifices for Providence Christian to be here. Higher education is not an industry that appeals to angel investors and hired hands. Providence Christian exists because of the great generosity and hard work of your parents and people that you may never ever meet in your life. Why resolute? Because those things that bring the greatest joy in life require hard work and perseverance. Don't let the difficulty discourage you. Don't let the challenges ahead overcome you. Know that you will experience a greater joy by working to the end of each assignment, each class, each semester, and this year. Why better? Because better is much more realistic than perfect. You've heard the expression, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Well, don't let the imperfect be the friend of the slacker, be the friend of the quitter, be the friend of the person who doesn't pick someone else up when they're down. What I'm suggesting to you tonight is that you make the better the friend of what's good. Finally, and most importantly, keep in mind the good. Good not in the sense of the satisfactory or adequate, the solid B minus. Good in the sense of what's salutary, wholesome, and a benefit to others. Live this year making your striving toward greatness a means to goodness. There you have it. Joyful, grateful, resolute, working to become better for the good for others. You know, this year will still have its ups and downs, but if you keep those five things in mind, you truly will be transformed into a new creation in him. Thank you. Sea beggars, welcome to the start of the 2018-19 academic year. I want to begin by telling you a story. In the movie, The Philadelphia Story, in 1940, it was a classic movie, some of you may have seen it, Tracy, played by Audrey Hepburn, is unable to recall what happened between her and Mike 
Jimmy Stewart, the night before because she had had too much champagne and fell asleep. Thinking the worst had happened and that her virtue and reputation was forever ruined, she was at first relieved to learn that Mike had carried her to her bed and then departed. But then she asks, was I so unattractive, so distant, so forbidding or something? Mike replies, absolutely not. But you were also a little worse or better for the wear, and there are rules for that. According to Charles Murray, in his best-selling book, Losing Ground, Mike was observing the code. The code specified a specific behavior that was taught to every American boy, that true manliness is in harmony with gentleness, kindness, and self-denial. But this code of behavior, or we might call virtue or character, is almost completely gone in American society, says Murray. What is now preached in America by our cultural and political elite is a self-expressive freedom that says you have the liberty to do whatever you want and whatever makes you happy, particularly in the area of sexuality. All authority of God, the church, the family, and tradition are rejected in this view. There is no code. Now only the individual can decide what is right and wrong, and the guide is psychological, therapeutic. Whatever helps you cope or get through the day is now okay. According to Murray, this has led to a schism of the soul. I love that phrase. A phrase he takes from the historian Arnold Toynbee's A Study of History. Toynbee said, in, back in the mid-century, that countries collapse when this code collapses and when the cultural elite turn their back on moral and ethical living and instead actively support and celebrate deviant behavior. And this is where we are now. Our hollow elite, as Murray calls them, no longer promote the code. That is an ethical way to live that supports the time-tested virtues of honesty, industriousness, marriage, and a religious way of life but rather, they attack all of these things and they celebrate deviancy. This schism in the soul erodes the moral foundation of life that is so important, not only to human flourishing in the glory of God, but also, and listen to this, our democratic republic that depends on individual virtue. And as I've been sharing with the first year students, and as our professors will spell out more in the days of head, ahead, here at Providence, our social, cultural, and political life will not be renewed until we return to the older version of freedom. Freedom within virtue. That is the view that freedom is not freedom from authority and God and family and tradition, but that true freedom comes when we learn self-control, like Mike did, when we learn to govern our sinful impulses, when we internalize the code as a habit, and only then can we freely choose the good, the beautiful, and the true and flourish as human beings are meant to. This is what the late Russell Kirk meant when he said that ordered souls lead to an ordered society and that without ordered souls, we have chaos. And our founders knew and taught that this kind of freedom, this kind of virtue, this kind of code, what Alexis de Tocqueville called the habits of the heart, as some of you first students will find out when you get to read Democracy in America this fall. They believe these are best taught and learned in Christianity, in religious families and associations. That means that we at Providence, as one of these associations, have a unique role to play in recovering this code, these habits of the heart, as Tocqueville says. We have the secret to true freedom. It comes in Christ and the gospel of salvation. We have the secret to shaping people through the scriptures, the liberal arts, and communal life that helps order the souls of individuals. And by ordering the souls of individuals, we have the secret to modeling to the world what this code, this new way of life looks like, the one that brings flourishing. Not only are we modeling it, but we are preparing you, our students, to take your ordered souls through Christ, you who have internalized this code into our society to replace the hollow elite who now govern us and build in order to build strong families, healthy, vibrant organizations and businesses, create culture that trumpets truth and beauty and goodness, 
and someday lead our political structures in a way that restores democracy and the habits of the heart. But the question for us tonight is, how will we do this? Especially since we ourselves are sinful individuals, so often tempted and succumbing in our own lives to the hollow culture around us and inside us. How can we do this when we ourselves are a product of the cultural's view, culture's view of expressive freedom that hates all moral codes, rules of behavior, any outside authority? And yet, if we don't find a way, I fear that our republic is doomed. The only way we can begin this project of cultural and spiritual renewal is first by having our eyes open, by repenting of our own anti-authority in our hearts and submitting to our wonderful creator. This repentance is the first step in seeing our need for our savior, someone who can give us a new heart, because it's only when we have a new heart, one that is not hollow, but filled with the love and grace of Christ, that we will have a new desire to live gratefully to our creator. Out of gratitude that God restored us from our self-centeredness, we will want to live for him. We will want to obey him. As we come together as Christians, our hearts renewed in part by the love and healing of Christ's grace, we will willingly submit to new guidelines, to a code, a covenant that will continue to shape in our, our lives individually and our lives together. It is, an, it is the only way to flourish. It's the only way to avoid chaos. This idea of covenants, so central to our reformed understanding of the scriptures, have been at the center of our relationship with God since the start of time. Over the centuries, covenant, covenants have made its way into covenants between Christians, both in the church and in the society. From the medieval Magna Carta to the Mayflower Compact to the 1641 Body of Liberties in Massachusetts Bay Colony, to the U.S. Constitution, this idea of covenants, have, covenants has shaped our public life together. We are a people held together by godly covenants that protect individual liberty and support communal benevolence. With the providence promise, we are joining a long, august tradition of writing covenants for individuals and communal flourishing. As you sit now, gaze over at the providence promise before you. It is this covenant, this code, rooted in the scriptures and spelled out in our handbook, which is now summarized in our new providence promise. If you look at the five promises closely, they will make it clear that renewal starts with right worship, getting our hearts and our minds right with God, the transforming of our minds, as Paul says in Romans 12, and then look at the other four. Live dutifully, love thy neighbor, academic integrity, honoring providence as an institution. In each of these, we see that once a person in community has right worship, that is, we present our entire bodies as living sacrifices to God as our spiritual worship, we will live differently. We live ethically, we live morally, we live for others, we exhibit character, in virtue, we support the community, and we learn self-control. As you enter this experiment in community, and as I've been telling the first years, we graduate about 25%, and we bring in a new 25%, and we renew this experiment in community every year, we have an amazing opportunity to heal the schism in our own souls, which will begin the process of ordering souls in our community, and then eventually our republic. So first year students, when you come forward this evening, this is not a hollow tradition. This is an act of covenant or code renewal. It is one of the most significant things you can do. When you sign this important document, you are joining the names of the rest of the community who have already signed it this morning. And you are participating in something magnificent, beautiful, and God glorifying. May you embrace this moment. Christo omnia nova, in Christ all things new. Amen.